Welcome to Time to Talk with Ross McCarthy. So we've invited Ross back um, for another chat all about dogs' dominance, um, nature versus nurture, and all of those lovely things that we have to deal with in relation to dog behaviour. So get yourself a coffee and enjoy as me and Ross McCarthy chew the fat on dogs, working with dogs and dog behaviour. Take care, enjoy. Hi folks, I'm here again with the lovely Ross McCarthy and we had such a good time last time when we spoke that we thought we'd get together again and just chew the fat. So we introduced Ross last time and told you all about him and what he's doing. And this time we thought we'd just chat about anything that comes up really, um, dog behaviour, regression, working with people, working with dogs and whatever. We have just been talking about my frothy coffee, which is very, very frothy at the minute, which um, it's a frothy machine that Ross got me years ago and I still use it. So do you, have you got a frothy coffee there? Are you still on the frothy coffees, Ross? Uh, I've got just a regular old, um, yeah, regular old Nescafe coffee. No froth, no nothing. I thought, um, I'm just waiting for you to get the froth on the end of your nose while we're talking. <laughs> and I'm not going to tell you if you do. <laughs> I'll be slurping away. <laughs> I know, I know, just chatting away with that on the end of your nose. No, I think also we, just, we should pay reference to the fact that we're now in um, week six of lockdown just to excuse um, the fact that we haven't had our hair cut or um, anything like that. <laughs> some period of time <laughs> I know I'm living with a permanent ponytail at the minute and kind of just scraping a back and leaving a little bit but I don't know who's struggling most with a lack of hairdressers me or Spud I mean Spud just yeah he's got dreadlocks coming over his face at the minute I know it's a real problem isn't it actually the yeah. groomers and things how are you coping with Bill <laughs> well a little Pomeranian she's very for anybody who doesn't know uh, Ross has got rotties and a little pom. How is she coping or how are you coping with that? Well, I never cope with her particularly well. I'm not a very good um, dog groomer at all. So I just tend to, because she's a pretty rough and tough little dog. So if there's a puddle, she'll go and lay in it. If there's mud, she'll run through it. Uh -huh. um, she spends half of her time sort of ginger on the top and black at the bottom. So um, <clears throat> I just tend to cut bits out. <laughs> which um, is easier than trying to groom and things. So yeah, I give her a little brush, give her a bath and then cut bits out, twigs and things like that. Yeah, I've been doing that with Spud. I've been hacking it into him. So he's yeah. got, when he gets groomed, because he's a boy, um, he gets a really short cut on his tummy, just in front of his willy. Because uh, people who've only got bitches won't probably realise this, but if you've got a dog and they've got long fur, then they do end up weighing on that tummy or it ends up a bit matted and a bit gooey and horrible. So um, I always get that cut when he goes to the groom. I say I always get that cut really, really short. Yeah. Uh, so he has like a, a short middle and then he has these long bits at the side. Uh, just so he looks like a cocker again rather than, than a, you know, a dog that's been rumped. Um, yeah. But it's all getting a bit long, so I'm going to have to get in there with my feather and scissors and... Oh dear, go careful with those scissors. <laughs> it back. Put my hand off it. Let's, let's cut this back. Yeah. Poor old spud. Oh my goodness. I know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's all pretty gross, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, part of dog. Well, we were talking about poo last time, weren't we? So it's all part of dog ownership, isn't it? I know. I was thinking of you today, actually, on my dog walk when I started poo picking, and I thought, <laughs> we're going to get. We're going to get to our favourite topic, which is dog poo. Yeah, exactly. And anal glands. We didn't actually talk about anal glands last time. No. Which is my favourite topic. <laughs> I, can't think, I can't think why we wouldn't have. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so the reason whenever you go on to anal glands when we talk about dog poo is because the firm of the poo, it kind of massages the anal glands and keeps them nice and healthy and empty. Whereas dogs who got sloppy poos quite often have problems with their anal glands as well. Mm. I mean, I'm really lucky. I have never, ever in my whole time of dog ownership had to clean my dog's anal glands or have them cleaned at the vets or anything. No. I've done other people's dogs for them. Okay, haven't. Yeah, that's never particularly pleasant, is it? Oh my God, you've done, you've done other people's dogs' anal glands. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's 
disgusting. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I've done a lot worse things than that. <laughs> really? <laughs> but we, we won't talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we <could. laughs> yeah, we could. Yeah, we could. I'm getting a bit warm already. Have you? <laughs> Okay. Yeah. I know lots of yeah. things that make you feel like warm. Hot <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh dear. Oh my goodness. Um, my dog's the thing I've been getting your glands done, like for the sake of their glands, but uh, they have had swimmer's tail before. And oh, yes. Had the anal glands done then to try and get them over swimmer's tail really quickly because that really helps bring the feeling back into the tail quick. Right. Anal yeah. Anal glands. It's funny actually because talking about um, people call it limber tail and all sorts, don't they? Different names for that, whereby the dogs, um, I don't know what causes it, but typically when they've been in cold water, if they've had a bath and you haven't dried them off properly, they get um, almost like a tail paralysis, don't they? Yeah, um, and really cold, really, really cold, icy driving rain will cause it as well. And yeah, limp, limp tail, limber tail, swimmer's tail, cold tail, all of that lot. Yeah. And, um, it's and if they use the tail as a rudder as well, and they're doing a lot of swimming and they're using the tail as a rudder, then that can cause it to go as well. And they don't really know what they cause it, what causes it. I mean, I think personally, it's um, when the sphincter muscles in the back end gets going to spasm, and everything goes really, really tight because of the cold. I mean, you know, it's like when you're really cold, yeah, it goes yeah. really tight, and I think that's what contributes to it if not what causes it yeah i mean all of my rottweilers have had it at one time or another um i've never known another i've never had another breed that's had it but um they've all had it and luckily they seem to recover within sort of a day or so without any medication or anything so i know people do give pain relief um mm. but no they i've never had to do that they've, they've recovered literally within a day or so it tends to be dogs that use their tails a lot as rudders because I mean that's what do they, when they swim in their tail they use the tail as rudders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's quite common, I guess, in gun dogs labs and things, isn't it? Really you can common. Doing water breeds and things. Yeah, and and you know, really getting them nice and warm when they come out of the water. So, and um, one of the things we were going to talk about was dominance. So, uh, that that old chestnut. Uh, yeah. Dirty uh, word, uh, word. Dirty dominance word. Yeah, I quite like talking. Yeah, I quite like talking about dominance. It's a strange. We always, um, you know, as you know, we do um, courses in dog aggression to dogs and people and whatever, and we always start on day one <coughs> with, um, you know, in the morning we always bring up the word dominance because that is a type of a classification type of aggression. Uh -huh. So we always bring that up because sometimes when you mention it, you get faces pulling and everybody whispering. Do you know what I mean? Because it's got such a strange um, connotation. You know, when you hear the word, people all have a completely different interpretation of it, like this old fashioned pack theory, you know, all of that. <laughs> and, Which, um, <laughs> when everyone talks about pack theory or dominance theory, it just makes me laugh and I go, yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah, I know. It's it just yeah. It's it's strange that a word can have so many different meanings um, to different people when it's just a word. Yeah, it's one of the first things I talk about in pet gun dog. Get straight in there, you know. It's straight, it's straight in there talking about dominance because um, people immediately. I mean, I I can remember years ago when the dogs trusted the um, experiment or the project or whatever. And they used that to prove that there was no such thing as dominance in pet dogs. But that was only done on 19 muted males yeah. during the time of their daily exercise. You know, if they chucked a bone in there or chucked a bitch in season in there, they would have had a very, very different picture rather than 19 you muted have males to. having a sniff. You don't even have to do that. You just have to go to an Akita breed show at the weekend and watch the <laughs> Watch the male Akitas in the ring and go to the Rottweiler breed shows and watch the male Rottweilers in the ring because when you're watching some of those shows, you hold your breath thinking, if someone drops a lead now, there's a problem. Um, so you do see it and it's more prevalent in, I mean, dominance to me is always kind of innate within the individual and it's more prevalent in some dog breeds than others. Um, and it, it is the individual kind of drive within that dog, really. But um, I remember years ago, there was a book 
secret and the more the more of a pamphlet really about dominance and how you know it's now being debunked which is a word you hear all the time I only ever hear that when you talk about dominance I don't hear debunked ever in conversation anywhere else um <clears throat> anyway so this little pamphlet was written and it said I guess facetiously that you know we think dogs are dominant and they want to take over the house and then take over the world and of course nobody ever thought that yeah. you just know that some dogs have um a drive to protect things that are inherently important to them. And that could be a tissue, it could be a bone, it could be a person, it could be a detail they've stolen, um, but it's whatever's intrinsically important to that individual dog. Yeah, absolutely, because it was after the study, um, I think it was around about the time of the study of the Dogs Trust, they started, rather than calling it dominance, they started calling it resource holding potential, the RHP of the dog. But yeah. it's just, uh, you know, it's just wrapping a thing up in a different word. And I don't understand. I mean, I, you, you know, you as well, you've, like me, you've studied wolves, you've studied lots of different animals. I worked with horses for years. You know, I, I cut my teeth on horses. And I don't... Cutting their teeth on you, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> they did that as well. <laughs> Had a couple of cracking <laughs> bites. <laughs> okay. <with them. laughs> but it's like... You know, you look at horses and you just look at horses in the field and there's a dominant, there's always a dominant horses. In, in any social group, there is a pecking order. And if there's a yeah. pecking order, there has to be dominance there. There has to be somebody asserting or some animal asserting a higher energy, a higher energetic being, if you like, you, you know, a stronger yeah. um, being, which is going to put forward what it wants in a way that is not up for challenge. And so, yeah. you, you know, it's the whole thing where, um, it's, it's, I, I can remember with Bart and Angus. So Bart was the stronger of the two dogs. He was quite, I mean, you remember Bart, he was quite a dominant, you know, very, yeah. very strong dominant dog. And, uh, but that didn't mean he was trying to take over the world. He wasn't, certainly wasn't aggressive. Uh, although he wouldn't take any nonsense from dogs, but he wasn't aggressive yeah. at all. And Angus was quite a low-ranking dog, but he was quite strong. Yeah. But if Angus had a fluffy toy, Bart wouldn't go near him, because at that moment in time, Angus's energy was stronger in relation to the toy, and he was prepared to die to keep that fluffy toy. And yeah. Bart would just go, you know what, it's not that important to me. But in the pecking yeah. order, Bart was definitely higher. Angus would always defer to him. Going through doors, he would defer to him in relation to drinking, cocking his leg. You know, Bart always did everything first. Yeah. No, it's, and I think people find it quite confusing because people often say, how come, you know, if you've got a lower ranking dog or a lower status dog in the house, how come they can keep hold of resources and the other perhaps higher status dog, and it just said, you know, leaves them alone. Well, because it's not important, uh, you know, it's important to the individual dog. And like I just said, that kind of varies depending on the situation and the dog. Um, and the problems arise when you have dogs that both have the same... Um, drive. Yeah, had Bart had mm. the same drive for the cuddly toy as Angus did, then that's when you have your little problems because the, the drive to have the toy is equal in both individuals. So therefore you end up with a little altercation, don't you? A little, a big. <laughs> well, yes. Like I've the dog people. being prepared to back down over the toy. Yeah, no, exactly. No, you do, you see it, and I'm, you know, I've witnessed several dog fights which are incredibly unpleasant for anybody that's, um, you know, seen those and been involved in um, over resources. You know, typically you have a, a, a group of dogs that all get along very well, and then it really doesn't take much to like the touch paper over a bone or a smell or whatever it may be um, uh -huh. to start, you know, causing a problem. But I filmed my dogs um, a couple of years ago now um, at feeding time and I haven't yet put the film together, but I had four dogs and they have a very clear um, social structure. Uh -huh. So, you know, so I, I did this feeding routine where just to, sh to show how, when I fed one dog, a dog within my group, what the other dogs would do to that. So some, you know, if I put a bowl down for one of the dogs, sometimes all of the other dogs would defer and just leave the food. 
but if I put if I fed a lower status dog, then Uts, the you know the the stronger dog, he would just pile in and eat the food. So, yeah. but they they have a very clear structure of who can do what, um, which I don't think is the case in everybody because it's all very fluid, isn't it, in, in social groups? But um, in mine, it's very clear the status of each individual. I think it's it's fluid at a moment in time. So I think generally you have a dog that is uh, more senior ranking or higher status or has higher energy like um you know when people walk into a room and go oh my goodness you know this person's important they don't say anything they just yeah it's, the, it's their demeanor isn't it and yeah. so i think that's always there within within a pack and i will call it a pack because that's the that is the term for more than one dog it's called a pack you know the yeah. um the collective noun for, for dogs is a pack, so I'm going to call it a pack. Um, yeah. And so within a pack, you will have, with a, you know, a pack living with you, you will have a dog whose energy is naturally stronger, who's naturally a high-born dog, if you like, you know, for one yeah. of the terms, a high-born dog. It's probably, you, you know, the one that was on the nipple first, so therefore it was stronger, more robust, its energy was stronger, it was able to climb over the other dogs, so everything about it. Um, indicate status and, and the highness of bone but then on a daily basis it might be fluid over things like toys, bones, yeah. beds, people yeah. but when push comes to shove that that rank is still there and yeah. I see it with Danny and Spud actually I've got a video of it I filmed it a couple of years ago and I did put it out there and I might put it out there again of uh, the dogs having a drink, so um, Dante's quite happily having a drink. A spud comes over to him, um, intent on getting a drink. Dante takes two paces back. Spud has a drink, walks away. Dante comes in, finishes drinking, and then Spud just walks past them, and Dante doesn't finish. He doesn't move away from the water, and it was yeah. that that intention of energy. So Spud came in. I wanted a drink. Dante went, "Whoa, okay, you can have it." And then when Spud yeah. came over. Uh, without the intention of having a drink, Dante didn't bother moving. No, exactly. And you see, there's, you see all this sort of low-level communication all the time, don't you, in the dogs? I think yeah. I don't know whether because we're looking for it because what we do for a living, and you, you know, I do spend probably a silly amount of time watching my dogs really just interact and whatever. But um, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? And I guess I don't know whether everybody looks at their dogs, but you do. You see really these clear communication signals that we would miss the, the human observer, but the dogs seem to have this very, it's a very clear communication system. Yeah, absolutely. And, and people do generally miss things like, um, I mean, I do find it funny when behaviorists or trainers say you shouldn't, um, you, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't stop a dog from displaying aggression. Yeah. You should, you should, we talked about it last time, distract and, uh, what was the word you used? Distract and something. Avoid, yeah, avoid. Distract and avoid. Rather than actually saying, no, that's not acceptable, you can't do that. And so they say, no, oh, well, if you stop the dog from doing that, then you'll break all the communication signals. But actually, that's the last thing generally in the communication is, is the dog responding. Mm -hmm. You have, you know, the glare, the freeze the um the turn away there's loads of stuff that goes on before the dog actually starts moving forward with with aggression yeah no exactly and it's the same as that um as the last couple of years people have been saying that they shouldn't punish a dog for growling and again the word punish is a weird word but um that's what they say you shouldn't punish the growl because if you do that then you suppress that and then the dog moves to the next action which might be to bite you or to bear it or whatever that that is for that dog um <clears throat> but I just think that's ridiculous. Um, don't, you know, people were saying, oh, I thank my dog for growling at me so it didn't oh, have to bite me. And I think, well, there's a, you know, there's a famous little film with it on. But, um, you know, thank, <laughs> thank, <laughs> yeah. thank you for growling I'm sorry, at me. I remember that. Me. We, we got in a lot of trouble for that, film. Yeah, I know, well. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but no, it's ridiculous. If the dog growls at me, then I tell it off. I don't want that dog growling at me. It doesn't move to the next level. It stops growling at me. That's it. Well, I, I mean, all you have to do is look at how dogs communicate with each other. And 
Um, but then also if you look at the science of learning, you know, people are like really in the science at the minute. Uh, but if you just look at how we learn and how the brain, um, how malleable the brain is, certain connections. If, um, I mean, I, I've talked about this loads and when we used to teach together, my whole bit was on how you learn and how mm. the brain sets up um, the neural pathways. And so if you set a neural pathway on the brain and it stops using it, you, you know, you stop using that behaviour, then the neural yeah. pathway will um, be reclaimed and, and uh, the neural pathway will, will cease to exist or it will take a lot to then resurrect it. And so if you're allowing your dog to growl or bark or continue to go down the neural pathway as a response, then that neural pathway is just going to get more and more reinforced and the response will be quicker. And so yeah. we have to stop the dog from going down or, or you know, humans as well. You know, when, when I gave up smoking, um, I had to stop doing the, the habit of smoking to the point where I couldn't go out for a coffee because in my head, the neural pathway was go for a coffee, have a cigarette. And yeah. so I had to stop the neural pathway completely and I stopped going out for a coffee because to me, that path led to smoking. Yeah. And so I stopped going out for coffees, come up with a completely different habit, set up a new neural pathway, and then eventually I could go out for a coffee again, although not at the minute. Um, yeah, not at the moment. <laughs> not at the minute. There's nowhere. <laughs> there's nowhere to go for a coffee. Um, no. But it's the same thing with dogs, isn't it? You know, we, if we allow them to keep using the neural pathway, then all we're going to do is reinforce it, reinforce that reaction. And so we need well, you to see it all of the time it. with, um, you know, when you go to see dogs that display aggression to people um, or dogs or, um, you know, dogs that perhaps are dominantly aggressive towards their owners. So mm -hmm. dogs that um, resource guard, and um, typically dominance aggression is over possession and position. So mm -hmm. possession of items that they deem important or position on furniture or beds or people or whatever. Um, and if you stop that, so that to me, dominance aggression always has an innate component. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we cause that by doing things, it's, that is the job that we have. And then we either compound it or we stop it. Um, and you see it all of the time that aggression increases because people aren't expecting their little cocker spaniel to growl at them at nine weeks old over food. And it might be funny or it might be shocking or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But because they're not expecting it, they don't stop it. And if you can extinguish it at that age, then like you said, that stops the action. And then we'll rub along more harmoniously. If you don't stop it, it strengthens and it fuels. And through a successful repetition of carrying out that action and it being rewarded because it gets to keep the tissue that it's just ripped up or whatever it is um then you know it, it continues and it escalates into different areas and we see dogs and I, I mentioned the cocker spaniel because they're one of the breeds that i see most commonly for that type of aggression towards their owners and you see dogs at you know four or five years of age that are really off the charts aggressive towards their owners when if they would sought help when the puppy was eight weeks yeah. ten weeks away, and it would have been a lot easier to resolve those issues. It and and it it happens really without people knowing that. Can you remember seeing a dog years ago? The dog's not with us anymore. Um, chocolate Labrador, and the owners, you know, gave me permission to write an article about it, so I don't mind mentioning it. But this chocolate lab, it was um, a, a puppy formed dog. And within nine months, it had to have its hips done and uh, it was up on the settee. So how it started was, it was up on the settee with it, with, with the owners and the nudged it and it growled and went, oh, you know, have I hurt you? I'm really sorry. And they backed off from the dog and then they praised it. They didn't, they went, oh, they're there, are you okay? But as far as the dog's concerned, it was being praised for reacting with aggression. And so very quickly the dog learned to get its own way through displaying aggression, dominant aggression to the owners. You know, it wanted the settee, it wanted them off the settee. Mm -hmm. And it escalated over. I mean, I ended up seeing the dog not for aggression. I, am, I went to see the dog because they wanted to bring their daughter's dog into the house and were both dog aggressive. They didn't tell me it was people aggressive as well. Um, well that's a favourite trick of people, isn't it? 
I know, I know. Let's not tell this person who's coming to help us with my aggressive love, <laughs> aggressive to people, um, until it attacks them. And yeah. and so the the it built up to the point where they had reinforced the behaviour through going, oh, they're there, don't worry, or no, don't do that, that's not very good, you shouldn't be doing that, um, to the point where if the dog got on the settee and they went into the room, the dog would actually attack the door to prevent them yeah. going in. And every time they went out, they had to put chairs on the settee and chairs on the table because the second the dog got on one of the, the chairs and the dog thought these were the highest possible resources, um, as soon as you started opening the door, the dog would attack the door and it would grab that door handle. And, you know, it was quite scary. Um, yeah. But that is all because it wasn't nipped in the bud initially. No, well, people, are, and obviously people get very scared of their dogs. Being on the, on the receiving end of an aggressive dog is not pleasant. No. Um, and people get very scared, so they try to avoid triggers. Um, you know, if you know that the dog's going to growl at you when it's eating, don't go near it. If, if you know it's going to growl when it's on the sofa, then don't go near it. And um, all of those strange actions that people carry out seem to compound it as well. I mean, mm. I saw a man, it's amazing what people live with and put up with. Um, I saw a man with a five-year-old um, Cocker Spaniel that was just attacking him on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, in all sorts of situations. Um, and he'd put up with that for years, which I found remarkable, but, uh, you know, very high level aggression towards his owner. Yeah. But it's, it's the catalyst, isn't it? I mean, I've, on my forms, I've got what was the catalyst to phoning me. And I can remember seeing this little schnauzer. Um, and, oh, I can remember talking to the woman and I ended up having to hold the phone away from my ear because the dog was just barking constantly. And... Yeah. Um, and she got me out because the dog was barking and they wouldn't shut up. And, I, I don't yeah. break all yeah. it. and within two seconds, it went and lay in his bed and stopped barking. And then the yeah. son dropped something. He, he was, um, I can't remember if he was uh, autistic or had ADHD. He was an old, older child. So, I mean, he wasn't a child, he was a man, he was in his 20s. But he dropped something and the schnauzer dived out of the bed and attacked him mm, and yeah. I, I was completely flummoxed it was like oh my god you know is this is, is this how your dog normally behaves he got me out because the dog doesn't stop barking yeah but yeah. the fact that it was attacking the 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 lad three or four five six times a day was wasn't on the spectrum because it wasn't um they were managing it you know he knew he was going to get bit so he kind of did things quickly so that the dog wouldn't bite them too hard. But the thing they called me out for was the barking. I know. It, it well, as, as we were just saying, I was joking about when you said, you know, come, and, come to my house and I won't tell you my dog's aggressive. I mean, it's really, sometimes this job is really quite um, dangerous. When, you, when people are calling you out saying, oh, I've got a dog that's you know, excessive barking or it's separation anxiety or it's peeing in the house and you get there and the dog's really aggressive towards people. Um, yeah. And you're, you're, you're ill prepared for that because that's not what you're expecting at all. And I've lots of colleagues um, that have found themselves in the, that situation whereby they're in a house and they're like, actually, you know, we need to deal with this problem above the rest of the things that you've got going on. Because legally, this is the one that's going to get you in trouble and, and it's dangerous. And mm -hmm. it, you know, yeah, really. I mean, one of the um, films that we play on one of our workshops, which I know you've seen, is again another Spaniel, Springer Spaniel. And this was some years ago when, um, so now I always visit people in their homes, but luckily, <clears throat> this occasion, the lady brought the dog to our offices mm -hmm. and um, she came because the dog was aggressive towards dogs. Uh -huh. And um, fortunately, because dogs used to come in there and pee around the place, we used to restrict the dogs on a dog parking hook, so just put their lead over a little hook next to the owner so that we could talk without, you know, the owners having to keep managing the dog and us watching for it weeing or whatever. And uh, so luckily dogs on a parking hook, and I just happened to move my chair forward on wheels, uh -huh. and um, <clears throat> the dog went bonkers at me, um, and just the highest level of aggression that you, you know, that you see that hasn't been trained ripped off padded arms and all sorts of things you know incredibly dangerous and she came for aggression towards dogs which is kind yeah. of irrelevant really when you've got a dog like that living with your kids it's it's an, it's amazing but 
because it happens so gradually, sometimes, you, you, you know, quite often it happens so gradually and we're amazing at adapting as a species. You know, people are amazing mm. at adapting. And, and as you said, you know, it's like, oh, well, I'll not do that because it'll happen with my dog or I'll not do that because my dog will do this or I'll not go on that walk because if I go on that walk, it'll kick off when it meets a dog behind yeah. the gate. Or, and so it, it, it's kind of um, the way I describe it and certainly the way I describe allergies, which is very similar. And I've just done a big quantum leap as I normally do. But it's like when a, you've got a blocked sink in the kitchen, um, it hasn't just got blocked when it overflows. It started getting blocked when the yeah. sink started building up on the U-bend and then it built up and built up and built up. And then eventually nothing will go down the sink. And that's kind of what happens in our job, isn't it? There's these little um, behaviours that the owners can't cope with, but it's not until they're at screaming point and the sink's overflowing that they get in touch with us because they literally cannot cope anymore. And yeah. they've been living with the dog like that for five years and the phone you up and say, I can't come to see you for six weeks, but I need to see you now. But hang on a minute, you've been living with this for six years. You, you no, know, and that, five no years. once they get to the point of we need help, we need help now. Don't want to see you next week. I want it to come today. You know, like you said, putting up with it for six years, but I need you to come today immediately. <laughs> but, now I've just been working with a shadow chasing um, dog. Uh -huh. And um, again, three year old female. And um, she'd been chasing shadows, like bits of light and, you know, movement, like your watch reflection, or if you open the, the cupboard and the fridge makes a pattern on the wall, anything like that. And not only is she chasing shadows, but she's obsessively looking for them. Or well, she was, luckily, thank goodness, we're doing all right. But um, no, and of course they'd put up with that for a long time and the behaviour is just embedded, 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 embedded. Uh -huh. um, and like you said, it's built up. I mean, once you look, the little puppy started doing it, they found it funny initially, you know, it's cute. And then, you know, from that point on, it's just got worse and worse and worse until, yeah, till breaking point, really. Can't cope with it anymore because it's barking and scratching at the walls and jumping and mm -hmm. scrabbling around in the garden, constantly barking. So, but luckily they're doing, they're doing good. Fingers crossed, we're doing good with that at the moment. And it's... Which is pretty hard. It's, and it's, it's difficult with puppies because what's really cute and funny with a puppy isn't really cute and fun with an adult dog with its full, te full complement of teeth in, adult teeth in. No, no, not at all. Not at all. No, it's amazing that people don't have the um, imagination to realise that, you know, their nine week old puppy is soon going to be, you know, a 45 kilo dog so that, you know, you don't want certain behaviours, do you? You want to kind of stop and suppress them before that leads to problems. But then that's our job, isn't it? That's what we do. So that's, you know, <laughs> yeah. luckily we can go and help and, and, I mean, it's a really interesting profession you're getting into, you know, and, and I know a lot of people don't, a lot of people who do training or do behaviour don't go on and specialise in aggression the way that we have. Um, for, for, for lots of reasons and I kind of don't blame them really I mean I've got Kevlar sleeves it's yeah, nice. you know the Kevlar sleeves when you go out make sure you don't get bit or if you do get bit it's not a puncture it's a it's if, if you all bit it's more of a crush rather than a puncture but I, I don't wear my Kevlar sleeves on my arm I wear them on my legs <laughs> I've put yeah I put um yeah, like great big long socks. I mean, absolutely hideous. But yeah, I'll get dressed in more. Because if I'm going to see a small dog um, that's aggressive to people, then I do. I'll put, um, you know, put them above my socks, like above my boots, under my jeans. And um, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, I mean, they're, they're, it's a good kit having the Kevlar sleeves. You touch wood, you know, I have it. Yeah. No, it just saves, yeah, it saves a little bit, doesn't it? But mind you, the last time I wore them, it was for a um, little Jack Russell crossbreed. Uh -huh. And um, so I thought, I'll put these things, because they only come up to your knees. You know, they're not like, you know, it's not like a full body bite suit. <laughs> um, so yeah, put my little socks on. And um, luckily, well, I went through muzzle conditioning with them before I went there. And of course, the dog just launches up into your groin aggressively. <laughs> so my, my Kevlar socks 
<laughs> we're neither here nor there really. but thankfully um yeah thank goodness for my this didn't come up high enough <laughs> didn't come up high enough was it muscled <laughs> yes oh that's a bit handy no it, well it wasn't handy it was because i told them that they should go through they went through a process of muscle conditioning luckily um because yeah no i would have been badly bitten and very badly injured but um yes it's a risk that we take with this occupation Patience, isn't it? Unfortunately, it's you know it comes to yeah. the turf, and and you can't always trust what people have written. You can't. What do you mean? Can't always. <laughs> well, you like, can never. Never. <laughs> I went to see. <laughs> I went to see two dogs. One of them was a rescue dog, and I went, and it wasn't the rescue dog I was going to see. It was the other one who apparently was kicking off since they brought the rescue dog home. At our wedding, and very foolishly thought right okay where's you know the original dog i was going to see and this blooming rescue dog jumped off launched itself off and literally i was i had slava all over my face and i actually felt its teeth on my face and i went i was just i i couldn't believe i'd been so stupid yeah. really because i went in saw the rescue dog saw the dog that was there to see had absolutely no information at all about this rescue yeah. dog no. Because I wasn't meant to see that dog and wasn't expecting to see the dog in the room either. And um and we got it down and it immediately just grabbed my arm. Yeah. You know, it didn't no. bite, but it had hold of me and it was you know, very, very dominant behaviour hold my arm. And I thought this is just madness. So it's right, really let's, let's forget that dog. That dog's fine, let's sort this dog out, you know. Yeah, I went to see, I mean, it's, you know, we've all got thousands of stories, haven't we? I went to see two Dobermans um, a couple of years ago. Um, not like my recent visit to see the five Dobermans, that was um, hair curl. But um, yeah, two Dobermans, and so I went to see this, the female was aggressive to dogs. Mm -hmm. Then the male, they were these European Dobermans, so cropped ears and dot tails. Okay. They're very difficult to read. And um, so the female that I went to see for aggression to dogs, she was very sweet. But the male who I didn't go to see was just this massive dog that just stood in the corner staring at me. And like I said, their body like, is so difficult to read unless you know them. And um, they just stood there very intimidating. <laughs> um, didn't do anything, just stood there looking at me for, yeah, two hours. Oh God, especially with the pin steers as well. Oh my goodness. It's, um, yeah. They're really intimidating. Because they used to be, when I was growing up, uh, you were probably only just born then, um, they used to be called the devil dogs, you know, the were, they were the ones that were in all the horror movies and... Yeah, well they're in all the old American films, aren't they? All these cropped yeah. and dock dobermans and things. Yeah, no, they're very intimidating looking. Um, but I went to see five a couple of weeks back uh -huh. um, in one house and um, for aggression. And that was, um, that was interesting because I feel like this, this is not like a Jack Russell that's going to jump up and nip your bum. This is, um, you know, five dobermans that could kill yes, you. Sir. Yeah, good, yeah, ripped into pieces, didn't they? So, um, yeah, that was an interesting, interesting console. And how was that? <clears throat> I, well, I'm here. <laughs> I've gone <laughs> out. Um, yeah, it was interesting. It was interesting. Some of them, I mean, yeah, three of them were very nice. Two of them were not, not very nice uh -huh. um, with people. Um, but yeah, luckily I had my case and my book and... Just, it helped. Yeah, just sat on the chairs, sat, sat still, and um, yeah, did what we needed to do with the dogs that I went to see. But um, yeah, no, very Did you have a low settee? Of course I have a low settee. <laughs> nobody has an aggressive dog and they just sit on a stool in the kitchen. No. <laughs> Take a seat and pop down, there's the dog. Yeah. <laughs> You've got the dog kind of drooling over the top of your head. <laughs> yeah. There's definitely, there is a shop whereby if you've got an aggressive dog, you have to go to this special sofa shop. So you buy the lowest possible sofa. So your visitors are virtually sitting on the floor with the dog towering above them. And that tips you, tips you back so you can't, you can't move. <laughs> yeah, great big. I don't know why. Yeah, I know. That, I know. Constantly. I remember going to see a black Russian terrier, you know, there's huge. Oh, huge things. And, uh, yeah, she said, oh, take a seat. And I sat down and just sunk into this sofa. You know, like, sort of go right the way back. Sunk into it and the dog was just leaning over the top of me. And I thought, this is, this is fun. Yeah. But, <clears throat> no, it's all, all, part of, all part and parcel of what we do, isn't it? It is. It is. Have you got, um, 
a favourite breed that you like to work with behaviour wise? Um, <clears throat> interesting question. I've never been asked that before. Hmm. Um, have a favourite breed. I'm that full I of interesting with. questions. Did you not know that? How long have you known me? I don't know, full of something. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't. No, I don't. I don't think I do have a favourite breed that I. Um, no. Have you got a breed that you find most responsive to uh, change? Um, I do quite like working with um, like the working cockers. I like those. Um, yeah, I find those quite malleable. Um, yeah, I like work. I mean, German shepherds and things like that. I quite like working with. Um, yes, the dogs that. Probably, I like working probably more with the dogs that are designed to work with man. So the shepherding yeah. breeds, gun dog breeds, dogs that are more malleable. The huskies, the Akita, um, some of the other um, <clears throat> sort of spitz type breeds I find all quite difficult because they're so independent and, yeah. you know, do their own thing really, don't need to be involved with, with you really. No, they don't need to be involved. Um, I mean, I find, uh, I mean, interesting that you said about the cockers being being more malleable because they can be seriously, seriously off the scale aggressive as well, can't they? Yeah, completely. They are, they, they are definitely number one on my list that I see for aggression towards people. For aggression within, towards people? Within the family group, yeah. So not, not aggressive towards people typically outside the family group, although they can be, of course. Um, but mostly for the dominance type aggression that we were talking about in the family group or in the pack, then um, yeah, the, the cocker spaniel, both the working cocker and the show line cocker, mm -hmm. definitely yes. number one. I mean, I find I find that as well. And people will say, no, no, you know, gun dogs aren't aggressive, or they're not that bad. Or um, I can remember years ago, uh, somebody dismissing me because I worked with gun dogs, not the, the one you and, and yeah. uh, new to the profession and it was like oh well you just work with gun dogs and it's like oh my god have you ever had an aggressive labrador coming at you because because of the breeding um and the fact that they all work in dogs they're really tenacious and they just never stop coming at you because that's what they've been bred to do you know um if, a, if, if you've got a working dog and you send in a thicket of brambles after a bird and they go in and they get a scratch nose and they go through, I'm not going in and that's what that hurts, I'm not going in. Mm. And then it's all done. We yeah. need them to never give up. And so, you know, they'll keep going and going and going until their faces are bleeding to get to the bird. And so yeah. faced with a person who they want to nail, they'll just keep going back. Yeah. And I mean, like you said, I mean, there are some breeds, of course, that are more predisposed to various types of aggression than others. Yeah. But equally, some of the most aggressive dogs, I think like we've already spoken about Spaniels a lot, um, I've seen some really nasty, I know you're a Golden Retriever fan, some really nasty Golden Retrievers, really, really aggressive towards people. Um, it, it's not common, it's not the majority, of course, is it? But, you know, it, no. there are exceptions to every, to every rule. And, I mean, I think, I think a lot of that is breeding, there's a, the, the, is aggression. In, in the golden retriever lines and yeah I'm, I'm I get all soft over goldies you know um but do you think do you think some of it with the labs and the goldies and with the cockers as well because they became really popular when um prince william got his cocker they became really popular too popular uh you, you know lots of people were getting them not realizing what they were getting so do you think a lot of it is that with the labs and definitely with the goldies you know they've got this lovely black mouth black eyes so when they grin the kind of you think they're smiling at you and they're not necessarily smiling mm. um but you think a lot of it is because oh well it's an andrex puppy so therefore i don't have to train it because it's an andrex puppy and then before you know it it's no longer an andrex puppy yeah it could be but i think also breeding has a lot to play i mean when you're breeding as you know we've, we've done lots of conversations you and i've spoken about this lots but when you're breeding for aesthetics, um, temperament is um, alters as a result of that. So when you're when you're breeding to the kennel club breed standard, your golden retriever has to have, 
you know, be as close to that breed standard as possible. So whether that requires a dark mouth, dark eye, you know, tells you how long the ear should be, how long the tail should be. Or if all of that, the angle of the shoulder blade. <clears throat> yeah. All of that. And with all breeds, I mean, all breeds have a breed standard. And um, when you're trying to breed, because that's what showing dog showing is, is trying to breed the dog closest to that breed standard. Yeah. And, and if you're not, you know, if you've got a dog that's a little bit sharp, or a little bit fearful or whatever, <clears throat> but that dog matches, you know, your idea of the British standard. Yeah, then actually, and the problem it, that you have is when you have a popular stud dog, so a nice look, you've got a lovely golden retriever that's a bit growly and a bit grumbly, and everybody likes that dog and they want to have a litter of puppies mm -hmm. with that dog. Mm -hmm. You don't just have one puppy per litter, you have five to 10 or whatever. Yep. And that dog's used on a whole lot of bitches. Mm -hmm. So you end up with 50, 100, maybe more offspring from that one aggressive golden retriever. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think that's the thing with Cocker Spaniels, you know, popularity wise, we had the, you know, that rage syndrome, I don't know whether it was late 80s, early 90s, people were freaking out because yeah. the dogs were, you know, this cockle age. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, I think breeding has a lot to do with it and popularity and, and if, Cocker Spaniels are popular because of the latest film or because of, you know, Prince, whoever's got one. Um, then, of course, there's a demand and lots of unscrupulous people will supply that demand. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's, um, it's the same with these designer dogs, isn't it? I kind of had to shut my eyes and I said, if I can't really believe I'm going down this road, but it's the same with a lot of the designer dogs, you know, um, yeah. the doodle dogs. Uh, the, there's a lot of gun dogs stolen um and then yeah. bred for these designer these designer dogs you know and it's just um it's appalling and when they're creating these designer dogs and i'm not saying all the breeders of like labradoodles or golden doodles or whatever doodle um yeah. they're not all the same but but they aren't necessarily doing the health test so they can get um and they're not looking at temperament either, so they can get a dog that has got a really terrible temperament and hasn't potentially got good genes either, it's, it's carrying um, health issues. And then they're putting that with another dog that they haven't checked out the temperament or the um, uh, the, the genealogy health-wise. And then they're putting out like 10 puppies and you've got yeah. no idea what you're gonna get. You've got no idea which yeah. dominant gene is gonna come forward. No, and we see it oh, a lot. We see it. <laughs> oh no, no, we see it a lot. Dominant <laughs> cockapoos. Yeah, dominant gene. Um, yeah, in cockapoos, we see it a lot. I mean, some people have lovely cockapoos um, that are quite, I say, dare I say, easy to manage or easy to train or quick to learn, whatever. Um, but some of them, again, they bring with them, you know, the worst traits of both breeds, and you end up with, you know. The, the the aggressive <laughs> nature of some cockers and then um you know the high energy levels of the poodle and you just you know you end up with a really very very difficult dog to manage um which of course is not what people sign up for they, you know most people see a cockapoo they want a nice little cuddly family dog and yeah. sometimes you get a really hardcore working type dog in the shape of a cockapoo yeah i know you get you get both ends, don't you? You get the independence yeah. of the poodle and the you, you know yeah. the strength of the poodle and the madness of the cock gun. Yeah, and the high energy needs and yeah, exercise requirements and things. So it's very difficult because you don't. I mean, unlike perhaps most pedigree dog breeds, you really don't know. And then, like I said, they're always exceptions. You could be really unlucky and go and buy a gold retriever and it be vile. Um, you know it could but um you know we can only do the best that we can do when selecting puppies but when you when you have crossbreeds you really don't know quite what you're going to get mm. so um i'm going to talk to you about nature and nurture this could, oh, yeah. this could be this could be a completely different podcast couldn't it but you know what people have said to me the half hour ones are too short and I want them for like 50 minutes to now so i'm going to launch into uh, talking about breeding nature versus nurture because yeah I've got different breeds. I've, you know, I've got, I've got the labs and that goes down through the boy line. So I've got Bob and then I had Ziggy who was his nephew. And I've got Danny who is, is his nephew. But then I also had Angus as a Goldie and I've got Spud which is a Cocker. And 
uh, Kenny, my husband, always stays. All my dogs turn out the same. Mm-hmm. Regardless of breed, they're all, they're all pretty much turn out the same. Mad yeah. as cheese, but they all have that same, like the Graham stamp, if you like. And so that's got to be nurture rather than nature. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because of different breeds. So, yeah. and I'm going to tell you a story about Angus. When I was teaching in Manuka, I couldn't go to club one night. And I got a phone call the next day to say that one of the trainers had been in hospital. She'd been bitten on the face and needed stitches by a golden retriever. And Mm -hmm. the golden retriever was nine months old. And so the first question was, well, why was it in a puppy class? Um, And it turned out that this golden retriever had never been trained. It was nine months old, really big, goldy, had never been trained. So they put it in the puppy class and the trainer was trying to get it to go under a down. When she went near it, the dog jumped up and took a chunk out of her face. And so the next week I turned up the class, next, you know, knowing that this Goldie had just put somebody in the hospital. And, and I said, where did you get your Goldie from? And, and she told me, and I said, that's Angus's brother. That's Angus's full litter mate. And so uh, Angus wasn't aggressive, but this dog was. And it was because it had never been trained. It never had any boundaries. It had never had anything you know, coming coming back to that re- relationship with raising your dog with boundaries, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. This dog hadn't had that. So when somebody bent over it, it said, I'm not putting up with that nonsense and it nailed her. Yeah. I think, I mean... <clears throat> That's yeah, two dogs from the same litter, a full litter brothers. Completely. Just, yeah. I mean, what I often say to clients when I go and see people with their, you know, dog aggressive dog mm-hmm. that I believe is kind of there, there's a huge innate component to that then I will say to them it's the luck of the draw had, had you picked the litter mate had you picked one of the others out of the litter mm-hmm. you might not have had this problem and um I think nurture and nature I think it's both I mean I had um my one of my rottweilers Roke he's um eight or nine now and uh, when I had him I had him at seven and a half weeks I think mm-hmm. and I went to um took him to Battersea Park so he was off the lead at Bassey Park, meeting lots of dogs because that's really important for that breed. They need lots of social interaction with dogs during that time. Uh-huh. Um, so anyway, he was off the lead at Bassey Park, seven and a half weeks old, cute little puppy, and a lady picked him up, um, dog walker, Lynn, um, picked him up to give him a cuddle because he was cute and he bit her face. Um, so he was really a nasty, say nasty puppy. He was. Um, inherently aggressive over certain things uh-huh. um, and clearly did dislike being picked up, manhandled and um, food removed and all sorts of things like that, <clears throat> um, which was fine because we dealt with that early on. So that's not a thing. And now it's completely fine and we can stroke him and you can you know, take his food away and whatever else. Um, but I think had he been in another environment where people weren't quite so prepared for that, mm-hmm would you know would escalate and and progress and I think it's very when you start looking at different breeds whether because obviously all breeds have these predisposed behaviors Uh um, that we some of us find attractive some of us less you know we'll find different things appealing don't we Um, but I think for example so the Akita breed that I keep picking on. So we're going to have Cocker Spaniel breeders. Keep going Akita back to the Akita breeders. Breeders. I know. <laughs> yeah, they're all going to be right and left us, yeah. Um, no, but the thing is, with like saying an Akita, because people, I often hear that, you know, it's all in how you raise dogs. It's all, there's no such thing as a bad dog. It's a bad owner and blah, blah, blah. And that makes my blood boil because there are some dogs that are born quite, um, yeah. Unsuited to live in... A human environment yeah and there are you know and like there are some people born intrinsically bad um but with let's say for example take the akita for example if you do everything possible you get a male akita you get it at the right age you do you socialize it to the book with other dogs and you put in all the effort and you train it and you do everything i th- most uh, most times when the dog gets a sexual maturity it will not tolerate other male dogs mm-hmm. So that is not a lack of anything that you've done that is inherent within that dog. And yes, it will play with other dogs and it'll be lovely and, you know, 
until the point that it gets to that sort of sexual maturity and it decides that that is not how life is yeah. gambling about with other dogs and so I think you know depending on the breed that you have obviously it depends on what input you need to, to counter that or to balance that um, but I don't think we can always just blame the owners and say no. oh, it's your fault. No I, I mean I, I find it really sad that here we are in 2020 and people are still blaming the owner he's like well there's no such thing as a bad dog well actually I've been at the wrong end of bad dogs and they yeah. have been removed from society permanently mm -hmm. because they're not in the temperament where they're not going to seriously damage somebody yeah um, and you can't ever say well maybe if you brought the dog up differently maybe this maybe that maybe the other because you just no. don't know it is, the thing is you can't, what it you is can't that make it time yeah, and you can't make a comparison. I mean, when you were saying about you, Angus and Angus's litter brother, uh -huh. we could say, well, you're fabulous and you're amazing, did a great job with Angus. Well, of course, of course I did. <laughs> of course, that's true. But, um, no, had you had his brother instead of Angus, uh -huh. that doesn't mean that he wouldn't display aggression. You don't, because you don't know, because you can't make a comparison because it's not the same dog, is it? It's no. like comparing two children. You can't say... You know, you see two children in a home, they're both very, very different. Yeah. One's an introvert, one's an extrovert, one likes, you know, colouring, yeah. one likes running. They're completely different individuals, and just because they're, they're brothers, um, doesn't, unfortunately, doesn't enable us to make that comparison. No. To know, does it's, it? I mean, I've got four sisters, and we're all, the chalk and cheese, you know, we've all got different interests, we've all got different careers, we've all got different, you know, dog people, cat people kind of things, so... You can't, and um, I'm going to do a plug now. So, you know, I updated the Peckham Dog Books. And one of the things that yeah. I've included, funnily enough, one of the things I've included is um, comparing it, like if you have tumbled stones, if you, if you get a rock and you chip off stones from the rock and then put them in a tumble and polish them, they will all come out differently, even though they've come from the same rock at the same time. And they've all been tumbled exactly the same way. Yeah, they they they're unique. They've got their own. Yeah, all completely different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it is. It's exactly like dogs. I mean, for those, you know, for, for people that do, you know, have breed a litter or keep in touch with people that have dogs that you know they've bred the offspring. Um, yeah, they'll tell you. I mean, it's not. They're all different. They're all completely different. But some of them have similarities, of course. But um, yeah, you can't judge one by another, can you? No, no, you can't. But it's, it's an interesting, um, it, it's, it's always an interesting discussion, but I think nature and nurture, you know, it, 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 it's, it's all of it, isn't it? It's both. Like we were saying earlier on, talking about dominance, which seems to be the theory of the, the theme of the podcast. Um, but, um, oh God, I had no idea where I was going with that. <laughs> I mean, everything contributes really to it. So, you, you know, in yes, all, so, it. everything <laughs> contributes. So, you know, you could take... Um, you know even twins you know so so like we'll get off dogs for a second so you could take two human twins so uh, identical twins um and you could feed them differently and you could educate them differently is the intrinsic behavior still there because they're twins identical twins is it is it not you know do they share that um do they share that all the way back i mean when i did uh three in one concepts we did um something called generations where things traits are passed down through dna and through the, the the generation so like a look or a mannerism would come down through generations um that won't go away through nurturing no no that is exactly. there that has come down and it's now called epigenetics is what people are it's now being called as epigenetics way it's um like energetic stuff that has come down through a line. Yeah. That won't go away regardless of what you do with them. That That is they, you know? Yeah. They. No, exactly. And I think it's the same, you know, as you can't change a dog aesthetically other than like clipping its fur and whatever. But I mean, you know, if you've got a golden retreat, it's golden or, or white or whatever colour they are now. Um, you can't change their coat colour. So why why would you be able to change the very core of, of what... They are. So if they do come predisposed with certain behaviours, mm -hmm. 
like the drive to chase or I mean some dogs have um, a really high prey drive don't they? like a very strong innate yeah, drive to pursue and kill squirrels cats rabbits whatever it is and you know I see extreme cases of that lots of dogs don't have that but some dogs do and that is yes experiences you know if your dog has 50 repetitions of chasing a squirrel then that you know fuels it and compounds it but there has to be the spark there initially yeah you know you know there has to be the drive the desire to do it and some you know with sports dogs and things we, we want some of that drive uh-huh. um which is why we, we breed dogs with that focus so that we can train them and work with them but um you know going into a pet home and having your dog legging it all around the, the park chasing everything is is you know very difficult mm. but um you know it's, it's intrinsic it's innate within certain dogs but then i mean that's their nature so their nature their intrinsic nature um is to chase but then the nurturing element comes in through training where we teach them self-control the behavior yeah. is still there and it's still in, intrinsic it's still very much a part of them yeah and but what we're doing through nurturing and training is to teach them self-control so that that driver's there yeah but but they're taking control of themselves until we release yeah. them yeah yeah and we focus it in different areas where possible don't we utilize that to, to our advantage and everything else but um yeah no i think that there are there are predisposed behaviors within breeds and within individuals some of those we can alter really successfully others we can alter less so because that drive to do whatever whether it's to be to guard resources or to chase squirrels sometimes the drive is incredibly strong Mm-hmm. But it's like, you know, it's different levels, isn't it? Some dogs half-heartedly chase a squirrel, others are all out to kill it. So, yeah. you know, there are different levels of different behaviours um, and you never quite know what you're going to get, do you? But you can do your homework, you can research breeds, but you never quite know what you're going to get. But I think the key thing is, is to highlight problems early on or, or you know, not even problems, but behaviors that you see that you think actually in the future that might not be so cool and yeah. work before it develops and before it escalates and before the dog has experience um to 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 squash that and move it in another direction yeah to, to um yeah to, to focus the energy to channel the energy into yeah. something more positive rather than something that would be detrimental not necessarily yeah. detrimental to the dog but detrimental to your relationship with the dog yeah i mean take for example you know border collies so i compete in working trials uh-huh. and I, say that. I haven't for a while actually but i should be but um but yeah so typically a lot of the dogs there are border collies uh-huh. so they are bred border collies are bred to cover miles and miles and miles each day herding sheep They're, that is what they are designed to they're designed to chase and to run and again to listen and to work with man mm-hmm. um but when you see those dogs in apartments in you know central london or whatever though those behave the dog has that intrinsic drive to run and to chase right and if you if you don't fulfill that then those behaviors start to come out elsewhere so whether that's chasing cars whether that's chasing joggers and nipping them whether it's displaying bizarre um a sort of ocd compulsive behaviors in the house like chasing shadows chasing like barking through the window herding children yeah the energy and the, the energy level and the the drive has to come out and if you do agility border collars are amazing if you do work controls they're amazing because you take that drive and you utilize it and you fulfill the dog's needs yeah through other actions and if you if you're unable to fulfill their needs then they start to fulfill them somehow themselves yeah. they have to come out they have to come out border collie can't just lay in front of your fire all day some do like i said exceptions to everything isn't exceptions there? But if on the whole <clears throat> then no that's not cool yeah no it's not and it is our job is to help people find things that will fulfill their dog's needs and make them easy to live with and teach self-control and channel that energy in a way that works for the whole family yeah and also part of our job is to um 
be realistic and to help people um, <coughs> redefine their expectations because some people are unrealistic. Um, you know, can you come and help me, you know, sort out my border collie and I only walk it for 20 minutes in the morning? Mm -hmm. Yes, I can come and help you, but we're going to have to increase the exercise. And if you can't do that, then we're on the road to nowhere, aren't we? So people's expectations need managing, I think, as well. Definitely. Definitely. Yes. Both ends of the lead. I don't know which is my favourite to work with. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> it's difficult, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> And let's not talk about dominant owners. <coughs> no, well, there's a few of those around, isn't there? There's one or two of those around, oh yeah. <laughs> she said grinning. <laughs> yeah. No, exactly. Oh, yes. No, well, that's what makes it all cool, isn't it? Seeing different, you know, different people, different lifestyles and different attitudes, different personalities. <laughs> oh, it's a, I mean, it's a great job. Anybody who's thinking about getting into behaviour work, it's just such a wonderful... Uh, a wonderful job it's um challenging at times and you, you know you have your work cut out for you and, and and for me one of the most important things is to stand up and be counted and do what you believe is right for the job and right for the family and not yeah. um, <clears throat> bow to fashions or trends or um i can't do this because no you know it'll go against what It'll, it'll go against the amount of likes that I get on Facebook. Yeah, no, exactly. Stand up and, no. and do what needs to be done. Totally. The dog and the owner. Yeah, no, definitely. And luckily, um, you and I have both got a lot of um, colleagues and people around us that we can chat to and that we, c we all do support each other in... Um, in what we do really so we don't so we're not on our own and we've got people to chat to which makes all of a difference and um now i can imagine that if you do work on your own and you don't have a network around you that that you can be easily swayed to think that you might be doing things wrong that you should change your methods and you know use different ideologies and things because of peer pressure but um like i said don't do that we are we are working for the dog and and our client aren't we yeah yeah, I mean, yeah, you've hit on the head. It's like when you do um, court work, you are, you are working for the courts and not, you've got to be completely um, unbiased and, and work for the courts. And it's the same when you're working with somebody's dog, you've got to work for that dog and that family yeah. and do the best for them that you can, regardless of everything else that's going on around you in relation to social media. Yeah, exactly. Because so what, what, what we're there for is if we can't resolve the issues, then people can't live with the issues. So the dog is in rescue or euthanized or passed on to whoever. Yeah. And that's not cool, is it? So we want, you know, in order to keep the dogs living with their owners and having a nice life, then we have to um, yeah, work to, to do what we can do to facilitate that. Yes. Yes, but it's been so good talking to you. I can't believe it's um, an hour. I think maybe it's an hour. Longer. Yeah, I know. It's like, oh my goodness, look at that! <laughs> Chatting with my mate over a coffee, yeah. talking about dogs. Yeah, and you didn't manage to get any cream on your nose, so that's good. <laughs> I, well, I thought I had a little bit of froth. I you saw me wipe it off at the beginning, and I took a drink and thought, oh, I've been left with froth. But you were so busy talking, I thought I could just really subtly do it. <laughs> No, you don't know, do you? Oh, gosh, no, it's a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, at least I'm not drinking. Um, we used to, so a little bit of background is me and Ross when we used to, I used to live in Marlborough and Ross was in London and we used to meet at Costa and we would start in the morning with coffees and then we'd get bored with coffees and we'd get all coffeeed out. And we'd go on to, what was it? Was it a slushy or something? What were they called? Was it, was it in Costa? In Costa? <laughs> I don't know, they were like mango, weren't they? Like cold ice. Coolies. Ice. Mango coolies. That's it, yeah. Oh my God, I would, I would take, a, and I would always end up with brain freeze. I, I wouldn't bit move with brain oh, freeze. Horrible. I horrible. Know. I mean, funny for me, hilarious, but... Um, hilarious. You know, <laughs> oh, my head, my yeah. head, my head. <laughs> oh God. No, oh, I do time. miss those days. We should meet up in, I don't know, halfway up the country. Yeah, where's halfway now? Somewhere I don't know. Man Liverpool or something. Liverpool, I think. 
yeah. <laughs> Bit of a trek, isn't it? <laughs> well, yeah, but, you know. <laughs> you're worth it. You're yeah, supposed to nice, say you're worth it, Les. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice city. We go on the um, ferry across the Mersey, can't we? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've done that once. So I won't try and do it again. <laughs> no. <laughs> Oh man, it's been really good to talk to you, Ross. What will we talk about next time? Because I'm sure you know we can get together and chat. Should we just yeah. have a coffee and come online and blether? Yeah, we seem to do that quite well, don't we? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we've covered quite a lot today. I think. <laughs> I think we'll have. I think. Yeah. So, um, it was great chatting to you, and hopefully next time we we'll get together on the podcast, we'll be talking about going for a coffee and oh know, i hope so lockdown. yeah i really hope so i mean we did the last podcast we did i think was in week one wasn't it of lockdown so. and that was pretty scary pretty daunting and now we're six weeks in it seems a little bit a little bit more kind of hopeful i guess i know it's all really unknown but it's um at least we're part way through it now not quite at the beginning i think i think we're about halfway through i think by the time we get out of it we're talking end of may beginning of june maybe mm, we'll see won't we i have no idea how we're going to do this but you know like i said we're six weeks in not on the first week so it's all a little bit slightly less daunting most of the time yeah mm. well hopefully next time we'll be out of lockdown and we'll, be, we'll have a frothy coffee together amazing yeah well thank you it's been great chatting to you yeah it's thank you great. <laughs> yeah, lovely. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You take it steady. Take care. Yeah, bye. Bye bye. Stay safe, Ross. See ya. Bye.